Good afternoon, buenas tardes, bonjour, and thank you for tuning in. I'm Christina Nosti, Director of Events and Marketing at Books and Books, and on behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books, in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with our indie bookstore partners, Left Bank Books in St. Louis, Missouri, Politics and Prose in Washington, D.C., and Prairie Lights Bookstore and Cafe in Iowa City. It's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual afternoon with Edouard Louis in conversation with Garth Greenwell to celebrate the publication of A Woman's Battles and Transformations, translated from the French by Tash O and published by our friends at Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. To introduce this afternoon's speakers, we're joined by Mitzi Angel, the president and publisher of Farrar, Strauss and Giroux. Previously, she was publisher of Faber and Faber in London. In addition to Edouard Louis and Garth Greenwell, who you'll hear from today, authors she has worked with include Chimananda Ngozi Adichie, Rachel Kosk, Ben Lerner, Yi Yun Li, Siddhartha Mukherjee and Sally Rooney. Wow, what a list. In 2011, she was joint winner along with Lydia Davis of the French American Foundation Prize for her translation of 03 by Jean Christophe Faltat. Remember that throughout this afternoon's broadcast, you can post questions in the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. And we thank you for ordering your copy of A Woman's Battles and Transformations from one of our independent bookstore partners and for supporting independent bookstores. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Mitzi Angel to the screen. So Mitzi, I'm going to ask you to please just close out of any open tabs you might have. That's where the sound reverberation is coming from. You probably entered the green room a couple of times, so maybe just close out of any other email tabs, and we should be able to hear you without any problem. Is that better now? Much better. There okay. we go. Sorry about that, everyone. I'm delighted to be here, um, and I'm thrilled to introduce Edouard Louis, whose new book, A, Wo A Woman's Battles and Transformations, comes out on Tuesday. I vividly remember the shock of reading Edouard's first book, The End of Eddie, the shock that comes from encountering something new, a searing autobiographical account of growing up poor and queer in a stricken, de-industrializing village, and a startling portrait of how the state exerts its power upon our intimate lives. I want to write only the same story again and again, Edouard writes in this latest book. And I like the way he says that, or the way he writes that. He writes about his family, among many other things. And in writing about his family, he writes about the ways in which violence between individuals originates in the class system. Now, he turns his attention to his mother. Edouard will discuss this extraordinary book with another beloved FST author, Garth, Garth Greenwell. I've worked with Garth for many years now. And it's such a pleasure when writers we publish talk to one another are in sympathy with one another, understand each other's work. Garth's debut, What Belongs to You, was nominated for the National Book Award and named a best book of the year by over 50 publications. His second book, the critically acclaimed Cleanness, came out in 2020. He reviewed Edouard's debut, debut in The New Yorker. So I think we all know this will be a fascinating conversation. Thank you everyone for joining us. And I hand over to you, Garth. Hello. Hi, um, Mitzi, thank you so much for the introduction. Christina, thank you so much for um, letting me be here to be in conversation with Edouard Louis, a writer. Oh, I am, I'm sorry to interrupt Garth, but we cannot see your image. So we can hear you, but we can't see you. So how about I just, um close out your video and reprompt you okay, okay. i can see you go 
I can see you as well, Edouard. Um, right, but, but we can, can see. see. Okay. Oh, someone can see. They can see Garth. Okay. Molly can see Garth. There we go. There you are. Okay, now we can see you. Perfect. Okay, great. All right. Amazing. Well, Edouard, it's such a privilege to be here with you um, to talk about your book. Um, and I wanted to begin actually um, thinking about your first book, because as for Mitzi, encountering your first book um, is sort of one of those moments in my literary um, life that left an indelible impression. And that book begins with what has now become a famous first line, of my childhood, I have no happy memories. Um, you frequently describe writing the book, both in that book and then in your subsequent books, as an act of vengeance on your childhood and the world of your childhood. But in your subsequent books, you've returned again and again to that world, writing and rewriting the story of your escape from it. And with each return, it seems to me you found more complexity and nuance in that world, what you call in A Woman's Battles and Transformations, fragments of tenderness. In your most recent book, Changer Méthode, which I hope will be available in English very soon, there's a very moving section full of happy images, of, or of happy memories, happy images from your childhood. So I think this is one of the more moving emotional and ethical trajectories I know in contemporary literature, um, especially in Who Killed My Father and A Woman's Battles and Transformations, um, in what feels to me like a great and rigorous exercise of compassion, you find nuance and complexity in the lives of your parents that forces, I think, maybe a revision of the declaration in the first paragraph of The End of Eddie that la souffrance est totalitaire, that suffering is all-consuming, suffering is totalitarian. I wanted to ask you how you've managed this reconsideration or this reclamation of your childhood and of the world of your childhood. I wanna ask you what had to change in the world to make that reclamation possible and what had to change in yourself to make that reclamation possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Garth. And thank you to, to all of you for this event today. You're just absolutely marvelous and, and so generous, Garth. So thank you so much. Um, the the thing is, um, my my present changed, so my past also has changed, and of course the past is a function of the present we live through and we are crossing, and in, in a way what I'm trying to do, uh, book after book, um, is to kind of uh, look at all the multitudes that individual contains which are not contradictory and they don't make each other less true than the other you know it's not because i say in one book that my father is violent and in, other, in the other one that was suffering it does for me i don't see it as a as a contradiction but rather than um, an, exp an exploration of the of the of the many beings that we have in inside us and you know i, I love to quote this this book from Wajdi Mouahad, a Lebanese uh, French dramaturge and writer, uh, who wrote a play called Incendie. Uh, it's a very terrible and beautiful and, and violent book in which, you know, I, I tell you the, the story very quickly. It's the story of a, of a, of a woman uh, in, a, in a context of war and she gives birth to, she gives birth to a baby. And because of this war context, the baby is taken from him uh, he disappears, she doesn't see him again, and a few years later, still in this uh, context of war, this woman is sent to jail. She's sent to jail, and, and then in jail, uh, she's uh, assaulted and raped every day by a guy. Um, every day, again and again and again for years. And at some point, right before dying, uh, she discovered that this guy who was raping him, uh, raping her, uh, was her son the son that was taken away from her. And so right before dying, she, she writes two letters to the same person. She, was, she writes one letter to the rapist and one letter to the son. And to the rapist, she tells him, I hate you and you destroyed me and you destroyed me forever and you destroyed my life. 
And to the son, she says, I love you and I wish you happiness and I wish you a beautiful life because you are my son and I love you and I never knew you. And in a way, in a much less violent way, obviously, but what I'm trying to do through all those books is to write letters to not only my past, but our pasts. And we were all surrounded by people who were monsters and victims at the same time, who were assaulters, people suffering at the same time. And, 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 and what it is to try to keep the radicality of each point of view is for me what, what matters here. Because usually we, we kind of use complexity in order to eradicate radicality. And what I'm trying to do in my books is to keep complexity and radicality at the same time. My father was a monster. My father was telling me I was a faggot. My father was telling to my mother that she should stay home, that she could cook, that she should shut up, that she should not wear makeup, that she shouldn't have a driver license. And at the same time, my father was a factory worker, destroyed by the factory. He couldn't walk anymore at 35. He was in a bed for five years without moving. Uh, he's not eating well. He's not, he doesn't have a good health. And how to keep this complexity uh, without losing every point of view. That's what I'm trying to do. And that's why every time I try to open a, a new page is because we live on a, a kind of, um, we have like we multiple objectivities crossing us at the same moment. And that's why I try to keep. Hmm. Um, you say in, in this book, in um, A Woman's Battles and Transformations, you say, what is called literature has been constructed against lives and bodies like my mother's. You say to write about her and to write about her life is to write against literature. So I find myself wanting to ask a few questions about this. Um, I want to ask questions like which literature, called literature by whom? And I wanna ask, whether writing novels has not often been an act of solidarity with the dispossessed. I wanna ask if these claims apply to writers like Emile Zola or James Baldwin or Toni Morrison. And most importantly, I wanna ask you, what does it mean to write against literature? Is what you are writing literature? And if not, what is it? Mm -hmm. the, the thing is that all, I, I always had the impression that the, the writers I loved were always writing against literature and against the state of literature and in a kind of, of, of state of anger against literature and what literature was erasing, what literature was uh, making invisible or what literature was kind of diminishing or or yeah, making making disappear. And so for me, like James Baldwin or Toni Morrison wrote about black people because they felt black people were erased from literature or treated in a racist way or about homosexuality. I think it's what André Gide did, you know, and he paid it as uh, the price was very high. He was insulted, he was attacked because he was writing about homosexuality in a moment where it was impossible and where the current definition of literature was to exclude those lives, was to exclude those bodies, was to exclude those experiences. And if that's in a way also what you, you are doing, God, in the way you explore sexuality, in the way you explore desire, and the fact that you explore in a way that was never explored in literature before. And when I, when I started to, when I say that I write against literature, I mean that when I started to write, I had the impression that there were so many uh, rules of literature that were uh, providing me from uh, uh, preventing me from from writing about people like my my mother or, or about my father like people would tell me that uh, for example literature shouldn't be too explicit that literature shouldn't be should be like a, a, a suggestive form and nothing is worse in literature than saying that a book is didactic that a book is saying too much and i had the sense that this kind of literary rule was a was a was a way uh, to not address the violence 
of reality. And when we know that literature is mostly made and read by dominant classes, by people who are in power, even if they are in power only culturally and not economically speaking, uh, of course we understand why there is uh, an interest in this world to not pre to not present reality too too much, to not pretend uh, reality too harshly, and therefore there is a kind of like um, a, a, a political interest that is being turned into an aesthetical rule and an aesthetical norm of of literature. And it was the same thing with emotions, for example. Uh, you know, when, when people talk about literature, they very often say it's a good book because it's, it's without pathos. Uh, there are not too many emotions. As if emotions were a problem in, in the literary field. And wanting to talk about people like my mother or, or my father, I had the impression that, you know, in my life, I, I, I encountered lives that would make you cry. They were sad life. They were life of people suffering. They were lives of people not eating. They were life of people never seeing doctors. They were people's life destroyed. And I had the impression that if I wasn't uh, making a book that would make you cry, therefore I was betraying those lives. I was making those lives invisible. And so at so many levels, I had the impression that writing was that fight against against literature and against uh, against um, the state of literature and what literature was telling me to do. So it's about, in a way, making an archaeology of literature, of the rules of literature, trying to find those rules one by one and to, to break them, to break them. Um, I, I think I lost you. I, I still see you and hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. I wonder if there's a meaningful distinction to be made between, you know, literature as a kind of cultural production or um, literature as like a prestige category, literature as an object of academic study, and then mm -hmm. literature as a technology. You know, because when I think of... Um, and, and literature as a, as a technology that has certain resources for thinking. You know, because when I think of something like your second book, History of Violence, you know, which in some ways strikes me as um, your book that most elaborately make, makes use of um, some very conspicuous elements of the technology of literature, um, things like point of view, things like time, um, uh, and it seems to me that there is a kind of consideration of a traumatic experience um, that is only that those resources, which I think of as like the technology of literature make possible in the similar way that it seems to me that the technology of literature, or I, and I, this is my question, I wonder if you would agree that sort of what I see as the kind of ethical work accomplished, ethical, emotional, also social, um, also theoretical, but all of this work accomplished through writing, I mean, through the resources of literature that allows for this um, sort of uh, reconsideration of reclamation of, of your childhood, of your own life, of the lives of your parents. Like, is it fair to call that also literature? Yeah, if you if you approach literature as a thing that you that you steal from, uh, that you you don't surrender to a, a, a mainstream definition of literature, but you steal elements from it in order to try to present a, a reality that you felt that was not represented enough or that was not uh, pictured enough. So obviously you are right. I mean, it's a it's a way of fighting against literature. Uh, without the literary field uh, itself. Hmm. Um, and, and it's be because of these double movements that we can, uh, I think, achieve another way of doing literature. And, you know, there is this, this famous sentence of, 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 um, uh, Fred, uh, of Nietzsche, who would say that he was doing philosophy with a hammer yeah. and kind of using a hammer to break one by one 
the old ideologies of literatures and the old ways of doing of, of philosophy and the ways old, old ways of thinking and of doing philosophy and still he was doing it in the philosophical field and my question is how much we can try to do the same thing in the in the literary field how can we kind of in this space break one by one the rules in order to to change the way the, the way of doing it and and i mean particularly when it comes to 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 to, to working class to working class people i remember that you know one day i i came back home with a book from 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 zola at home when i was when i was a kid when i was a teenager and my mother was in the living room and when she saw me with this book from zola uh, she told me oh that guy he was on our side and it was fighting for the poor. And I know that my mother never had an opportunity to read Zola. She did, never had access. She cannot read Zola. She cannot read. It's too difficult for her. But she knew that somewhere in this world, in this literary field, there was someone who was caring about her, fighting for her. And I always wondered, like, who is fulfilling that role today? Who gives you the impression that he or she is fighting for you? even when you don't have access to it. There is something kind of magical about it. And in doing so, I think it cannot, it cannot happen without making this kind of uh, archaeology of what, you, what literature is and the ways of doing literature that prevent us from really talking uh, about the people that I, that I want to talk about. And so, yes, you are right. It's a, it's a fight both within and against literature. But maybe that's the best gift we can do to literature, which is to question and challenge it. Mm. Because if we just take literature for granted and we, if we love it too much, we will be doing what we, literature has always been doing. And I find that this struggle is the best tribute that we can make. Mm. Um, before I ask my next question, I want to remind everybody that um, you can ask questions. Please don't ask, please don't wait um, for the end of the talk to ask your questions. Go ahead and put them in the question box. We'll try to have maybe 10 minutes um, for questions at the end. So, Edouard, in the end of Eddie, you make diagnoses of the causes of the conditions of the world of your childhood with sometimes breathtaking confidence. One of the things that fascinates me in Indivedi, and one of the reasons it's such an emotionally powerful book, is what seems to me to be a tension between those diagnoses on one hand, which often depend on the sociological theories and structural analyses of thinkers like Pierre Bourdieu and Michel Foucault, and the concrete granular details of character and sensuous life we associate with the novel. Um, concrete granular details that are often necessarily erased or rendered invisible by structural analysis. I'm struck in A Woman's Battles and Transformations as also in Changer Method by what seems something that I wanna call like a new vulnerability, a new willingness to be bewildered by a complexity that defeats totalizing theories. Um, I found myself keeping track of the number of times that this book is filled with expressions like I can't find the words to explain. I felt language disappear from me. I didn't understand why. Maybe most importantly, at the very end of the book, after considering all the ways in which your mother, despite her transformation, the transformation that the book retells, leads a life circumscribed by class violence, you write, and this is a quote, and yet, and yet she is happy. She keeps telling me this. I no longer know what or how to think. I'm struck by how radical that statement is. I no longer know what or how to think. Perhaps the question is not what change means, but what happiness means. I haven't found any answers. So I'm interested to know if that trajectory I've sketched out from something like confidence to something like bewilderment seems accurate to you as a description of the movement between the books and also whether you could talk about how writing your books and how witnessing things like your mother's transformation has changed your relationship to the theories and philosophers that I know have been crucial for you, 
like Bourdieu and Foucault. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the, the thing is, um, I came to realize that maybe um, after writing The End of Eddie and History of Violence, I came to realize that maybe talking about failure uh, was the highest form of autobiography. And in order to continue to, to dig this uh, autobiographical project, um, this idea of failure, of not succeeding, of not understanding, appeared to me as, the, as a kind of radicalization uh, of the autobiograph uh, autobiographical project. And, you know, I, I feel that we are surrounded by categories that we never fit in, you know. Uh, all our lives are structured by categories of what it is to be a good man, of what it is to be a good woman, of what it is to be a real man, of what it is to be a good parent, of what it is to be a serious writer, of what it is to be a gay person, of what... And we all experience that we, that we never fit in those categories. They never work on us. And historically and sociologically, the most fascinating aspect of it is that even though we never fit in, those categories are here and they are so hard to change. And so there is a kind of permanent gap between categories, norms, and rules, and what we go through with our bodies. And, um, you know, like, uh, if I take my childhood, I, I, I realized that all the men in my childhood would say, a man should never cry, a man should be that, a man should be that. And, and my father was always crying and my mother would never cry, you know? Uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at uh, the, the, the history at, at the completely opposite of the social spectrum, if you look at the history of the royal English family, uh, no one fits the rule, you know? It's the aristocracy, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the homeless aristocracy, and you have people who never fit in. You have someone who uh, has an affair with someone, you have someone who doesn't want to be a king, you have someone who this guy has a Nazi, you have someone who uh, is a lesbian, you have someone, and, and this is a world of extreme rules, and nobody fits in those rules, and yet those rules almost never change. The norms almost never change. And I think that's what we go through in, in, in all our lives in very different contexts. We don't, we, we and, 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 and yes, once again, the incredible thing is that you can, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, people never fit in those categories, and those categories remain so strong and almost unchanged. And what I'm trying to do when I write it is, is to is to kind of explore this mystery, and and therefore to to talk about uncertainties, to talk about uh, failure, is precisely as I was saying the most radical and honest way of doing autobiography because it's kind of uh, uh, um, saying I out trying to say I outside of those of those norms that we never fit in. And so there is something about saying, I fail, therefore I am, because uh, there is nothing in common between the reality of our bodies and the discourses about uh, our bodies. And that's what I'm trying to find something um, and that I'm trying to, to explore. That's a wonderful response. Um, so I have one final question for you. So again, I want to encourage everyone who's joined us to put their own questions um, in the chat. Um, but it seems to me that thinking of, of philosophers like um, Foucault and Bourdieu, that the big answer, unanswerable question raised by such thinkers, which is also, it seems to me, the big unanswerable question raised by much of the great art that I love, um, is the extent to which we're trapped in systems of power and the extent to which those systems fail to be totalitaire, to use your word from end of Eddie, the extent to which there are glitches or failures or unoccupied spaces in those systems 
that allow for something like freedom. There's a moving moment, or at least maybe freedom isn't the word, but something not entirely determined. Um, there's a moving moment in a woman's battles and transformations where you describe how in the wake of your mother's transformation, your younger brother's life is also transformed. And you write, one transformation leads to others. I wonder if you see your own transformation from Eddie Belgal to Edouard Louis as having created the conditions of possibility for your mother's transformation and whether your mother's and brother's transformations might occasion or have occasioned additional transformations in you. I guess I think your most recent books suggest to me that they have. And if so, is this sort of um, sequence of interlocked transformations a function of systems of power? Or is it some surplus or excess that escapes power? Something that, again, maybe we don't want to call quite freedom, but something perhaps not entirely determined by oppressive systems. And I guess my final question would be, if that's true, then um, is there a way in which we might think of transformation as a strategy for resistance? Yeah, I, 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 I absolutely that there are there are some chains of liberation the same way there are chains of, of violence. And in a way, violence reproduces violence and liberation can reproduce uh, many liberation, like how many women have been transformed by reading Simone de Beauvoir, for example. Simone de Beauvoir talks about it in her memoir. There were like thousands of women reading her work and suddenly seeing something in their life and being wanting to, 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 to change that. And it was obviously linked to the transformation of, of Simone de Beauvoir herself. And I can say it about me, I would have never be able to transform myself or to escape my childhood if I had an access to stories of liberation, to stories of escape that made it possible, thinkable uh, in my mind. And that's perhaps one of the, when you were talking about the things and the technologies that literature can give us, maybe it's, it's one of them. It's telling stories of liberation generates a kind of chain of, of metamorphosis because very often change and escape are just unthinkable. But, but what I think also is that if we want to achieve um, real changes, uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't, as you were suggesting uh, um, uh, rightfully, uh, we shouldn't oppose uh, structures and, and liberation. And this is for me the core of this, of this book about, about my mother what we could call in a way of a, a paradox of domination. The fact that because my mother was dominated so violently as a woman uh, by my father, by masculine domination embodied in my father, this is because she was going through that, that she was able to liberate herself at some point. Because the thing is, um, it was my father who would tell to my mother, you stay home, you have to cook, you have to raise the kids, you have to do that. And the story of the book is that one day she comes to reclaim what had been stolen from her. And so if you take the opposite example, if you take the example of my father, who was this dominant man, dominant father in the family, the problem with someone like my father is that all the violence he went through in his life, he went through it with, the, with a kind of illusion of freedom. He thought that it chose everything, you know? He was drinking a lot because it was a masculine thing to do, and therefore he destroyed his body. And therefore now he cannot breathe normally, he cannot uh, walk normally, he, could, he cannot do like simple things. Uh, he didn't go to school, he didn't want to study, because for him it was a performance of his masculine identity to not go to school, to not obey the teacher, to not submit himself uh, to what the professors would ask him to do. And so in a way, everything that crushed him, even if it was obviously alienation, he went through it with the illusion of, of, of choice and the illusion of freedom. 
But my mother as a woman, she never had this privilege. She never had the privilege to think that it was her decision to stay home, that it was her decision to shut up, that it was her decision to not put makeup, to, to raise the kids and to do nothing. And, and, and because of that, she was at some point in, in this kind of complex chain of metamorphosis that you were talking about. She was able to say, I'm going to take back what society uh, took from me. And so you see here that there is like a very deep intrication between the social structures, the social structures of domination and the possibility for, for freedom. And, and that's what I was also trying to say about, about my trajectory, uh, uh, mostly in, in, in Changer Method, the last book that's going to be published, I think, next year in English. Um, I wanted to, to, to show that uh, in, like uh, the kind of parallel situation happened in my life, not as a woman, but as a gay person. I escaped not because I was more free than the others, not because I was more clever than my mother, not because I was more sensitive than my father. It would be awful to think that way. It was just a situation of oppression in which I was condemned to be free. It was be free or die. And so I wonder how can we articulate um, uh, uh, this kind of structural approach to violence and to domination and a way of finding uh, uh, strategies to escape. And I think if we oppose them too easily, uh, then we fall into the naivete of the bourgeoisie who thinks that freedom is a de declaration. You know, it's like those moments where people say, you should be free, you are free, being free is beautiful. Freedom is not a declaration. Freedom is a collective struggle to create conditions in which people are able to create and to engender changes and metamorphoses. And um, in, in a way, this, this structural approach to, to, to liberation is for me much more optimistic than the bourgeois individualistic uh, ideological one. Um, because if you, are, if you think that freedom is a declaration, then you wait for people to rise and you let the other die. You let the other die in their corner. But if you think in freedom in terms of social forces, political forces, political structures, then you have to fight in order to create those conditions. What did create the liberation of my mother? Why there was not those conditions for other people, for other women in other contexts? I think it leaves us with a kind of task to do. And uh, so, yeah, I, 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 I think that when people see structures as a problem in terms of, of liberty, in terms of emancipation, I think it's a, it's a mistake and that this opposition is old fashionedly bourgeois. Thank you so much, Edouard. It's such a joy to get to no. talk with you. Um, I want now to turn, we have some questions uh, in the box, so I want to turn to them and let some other voices into the room. Um, so here's a, a comment. Uh, Edouard, I find you to be Dura 2.0, and you are, you are as brilliant and, imp and as important as Dura. Um, <laughs> it was your writing that helped me finish two different theses, Je vous remercie bien. Uh, do you have anything, anything you want to say about Dura and your relationship to to Marguerite Dura? So many things. <laughs> Thank you. I, I cannot, uh, <laughs> I cannot take that compliment that easily. I love Marguerite Dura too much. <laughs> uh, no, what I could say about Dura is pr precisely her what we were talking uh, uh, about right before with Carl. Her willingness to always challenged the system uh, of literature. The fact that she was so, in a way, so loved and so detested by so many people. I mean, in France, she was driving people crazy. If you look at the archives, some people really wanted to put her down. And I think, in a way, it's beautiful. And sometimes when you're trying to, to write political or radical things, um, people always end up asking you, but how do you feel about being attacked or about being challenged and about receiving so much violence? And for me, this question is bizarre in a way, 
uh, we should reverse the question and ask it the other way around and ask to the people who are not challenged and ask the people who are not insulted, why aren't you insulted? What is the problem with you? Maybe you are not, maybe you are not challenging literature enough. Maybe you are not challenging this world through literature enough. And for me, Marguerite Duras is the is the really like a, a model for that to try to always fight against the, the, the current state of, 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 of the world in, 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 which, in which she was. And uh, I love this kind of passion that she was creating. And I think that as a writer, you should always wear insults and attacks as medals, as proofs that you make people uncomfortable. And uh, I think that is what is missing maybe today in the literary field. I think that so many people want to be loved and they forgot about the importance of being detested. Um, there's a, a wonderful question about a formal choice of your recent books, both of the books about your parents and also in Changer Méthode, um, you use in epistolary form. And the question is, Edouard, why did you choose to write this book as a direct address? How do you describe the form of the book and what does it allow you to access? Uh, yeah, first, it, it, it wasn't completely, uh, it wasn't uh, epistolaire. Uh, it's, it's because I wrote, I, I first wrote Who Killed My Father for theater. Um, and so did I for a woman's uh, battle and transformation. So I was imagining a, a space in which a son is trying to talk to his father or is trying to talk to his mother and doesn't get the answer that he wanted to get, which is, I think, a feeling that we often have when we want to understand the people that surround us, or particularly our parents. And the thing is that at, at that moment, I was when I was writing those books, I was translating uh, books from Anne Carson in, into French, uh, tragedies from Anne Carson, adapted from, from um, Sophocle and from Euripide. I was translating them into French. And it made me wonder uh, what would be a contemporary tragedy? What would be a tragedy of today? Um, and that's why, where I, start, I started to write about my father or, or my mother. And in a way, uh, and also it rejoins what you were saying, Garth, uh, the tools of literary, uh, of tragedy, of Greek tragedies, were the tools that helped me in a way fight against the, the current state of literature, because tragedies are short, because tragedies are very violent, because tragedies are very explicit, because tragedies are full of pathos. And I found in the tragedies the tools in order to address a certain uh, amount of reality, a certain amount of like um, some system of violence, some system of tenderness, some systems of uh, confrontation. I found them in the in the literary in the tradition of, of, of Greek tragedy. And that's why those books were uh, addressed, because they were written in this kind of a confrontative uh, uh, form. And mm -hmm. that's how everything started. I think maybe time for one final question. Um, and this is, this is a question that you engage in the book. Um, you raise explicitly in the book the question of um, whether you, as someone who has been constructed, perceived as a man, um, can uh, enter into and understand the experience of your mother. Um, and this question is, um, what place do you think this book, A Woman's Battles and Transformations, has in feminist struggles today? What or who does it oppose or ally with? Um, yes, it's, it's um, the, the, the what the idea that I was uh, and, and the feelings that I was was that um, women like my women like my my mother were uh, not only absent from the literary field but were also mostly absent from the political field and that every time in the public space people were talking about women they were talking about women except women like my mother and this book started to as a way of saying, like, uh, there are women who go uh, 
through this and this and this and and why those sufferings why why those violence are so invisible from from the field um i i was as i say in the book i was i was constructed as a, as as a man but as a gay man i never I never experienced the real privileges uh, of being a man. I never had camaraderies with other guys at school. People were bullying me. Uh, I was not protected from uh, sexual violence. I was raped, and I said it in in my second book. I wasn't. I wasn't getting all those like rewards that society gives to men. And I thought that it was. And still, I'm not. I'm not subjected to the violence a woman is experiencing when she's walking down the street in the night and everything. But what I say in the book is that I try to kind of explore this blurring of my identity to understand a few things about my my mother life. And um, I also believe that uh, you know I don't I don't I don't only believe in experience anyway i think that i really i know it's it's very cheesy to say but i don't think that you should be gay to talk about homosexuality or that you should be a woman to talk about to talk about women and i know it because for example as a when i was a gay boy in the closet i wanted to be protected from the homophobia and so i was reproducing some homophobic structures i, I in order to put uh, homosexuality far from me i said it in the end of Eddie when i would see a gay boy i would call him a faggot and everything to put the hate on someone else and it's not because i was gay that i was more able than other people uh, uh, to talk about homosexuality and uh, sometimes the fact that you are inside an experience is what makes you unable to talk about this experience. And when I was writing this book about my mother, I was talking to her. I asked her if I could write that book. I asked her if I could use her name. I asked her if I could include photos from her. And when I was doing so, uh, I was talking to her about the way that men were treating her. And I, I remember telling her, but the way that my father treated you and the way that men treat women, and, and my mother was telling me, uh, oh, no, it's just that your father is a moody person. He just has this awful character of always being moody and always being in a bad mood. Because my mother never got access to uh, Simone de Beauvoir or Angela Davis or Judith Butler or Violette Le Duc. And so in a way, if my mother had written her autobiography, she wouldn't have uh, speak about masculine domination. And it would have been an issue. It would have been a problem. She would have said, I grew up with, I, I was living with a moody person. Mm -hmm. And so I find that sometimes these ideas of identity and saying that we should talk about our own identities is very often a, a bourgeois way of thinking because it never takes into consideration that there are some people who are prevented uh, and who don't have access to the tools to understand their own life. And so sometimes, uh, to say let people speak is a synonym of let people die because it's opening the door to the fact and, and ignoring the fact that, that, that some people don't have the access, the resources to talk about their own life. And for the bourgeoisie, it's easy to say let other people speak because they have access to everything. They have access to the understanding of their life, of their body, of the experiences. But it's not the case for, for everyone. And uh, if, as a gay boy, people would have would have would have said to I don't know, like a straight person talking rightfully about homosexuality, as they would have said, let him talk, I would have died because I wasn't able to do it. I wasn't able to do it because I was inside it, because I was stuck inside it. So, sometimes taking someone's voice and giving someone's voice is the same thing. Sometimes there is no opposition. And in my personal experience, it's because some people took my voice before me that I was able to get a voice. And that's what I'm trying to do with my mother now. And when I see her now, she tells me, I'm so glad I'm on the cover of a book <laughs> in another country. And she feels she has a voice. And now we talk about so many things that we wouldn't talk about without this book. And so my book is also a statement about that and, and a kind of fight against the mainstream idea that we should not talk about other people because I think we will produce the violence in doing so. 
Thank you so much, Edouard. Um, that seems to me like a beautiful point to end on. Um, so thank you, and thank you to everyone for being here with us. Thank you so much. That was such a marvelous conversation. Thank you so thank much. You. Such a deep thank conversation. You. Oh my gosh, congratulations on this beautiful book. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Thanks to our partners, Left Bank Books, Politics and Prose, and Prairie Lights Bookstore. Um, and we'll see you in person maybe next time <laughs> and soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, to, thanks to the bookstore and thank you guys for being so wonderful like always. <laughs> thank you. Bye everyone.